Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside the Borough, the FEU podcast for and by fans. My name is Dan. Uh, I am joined this week by Jack and Shane as usual. And tonight we are going to go down, uh, go over and break down the loss, excuse me, FEU's loss to Marshall, uh, 36-31. Really a, a heartbreaking, heartbreaking loss. FEU had its chances. Uh, there's a there is a lot to to digest, so I, I won't go into my normal long rant uh, and kind of opening spiel as I normally do. But FAU had their chances. I think the the by and large, an, an opportunity. Certainly, things get more difficult for us down the road. Um, not the end of our season. Not the end of our our chances for for Conference USA East. Um, but uh, there's some officiating issues, some offensive line issues, some quarterback issues defensive issues I mean there, there's a lot that we can kind of dig into um and I guess we'll l- let's start with one of the 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 bigger things and I'll, I'll send it to you Jack um <clears throat> uh certainly offensive line gave up seven sacks um what is in, and you were up in the press box I don't know maybe, maybe what was your your view up there what do you think was more uh you know something that that I don't know some sort of explaining on why the offense gave up seven sacks uh, Dan, I wish I had a, a solid answer for you, but it just seemed to be like a, a combination of several things. Uh, the right side of the line kept getting blown up uh, throughout the game, uh, but also Chris made some poor decisions. Uh, and he's, he's the first to admit that in the press game, press conference, uh, post game press conference. Uh, the very first question he said, this, this one's on me. This is my fault. He made a lot of poor decisions uh, when it came to, trusting his offensive line, trusting the running backs, the play calling, and then trusting his receivers. Uh, we've been talking about it all year, guys, about how weak that right side of the um, offensive line is, especially now with, you know, BJ Etienne transferring over there. We were hoping things would be a bit better. Um, but he, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, I definitely think it was a mixed bag. Of, of a lack of a rushing attack, even though the, the two running backs did a, a solid job considering uh, lack of time and just poor decision makings. But that, that being said, Chris has been off the past few games, guys. Uh, even when he had time uh, and he has established himself in the pocket, has his feet set, he's overthrown guys uh, and he's made other bad decisions. So, uh, you know, he's playing like a redshirt sophomore right now. I think we've gotten pretty lucky that Earlier in the year, he's been playing like a, a junior or a senior. We, we forget how young he really is. Uh, so maybe this is just an opportunity for us to kind of take a step back and realize uh, how lucky we really are. Well, just kind of going through the game, uh, it, it, this one I think a few fans are just more frustrated because it's, it was like a few like last year where we thought uh, we were kind of the better team and we should have ultimately should have won the game. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about officiating and everything that's going on with Lane right now, but in, in jacket on the head, I went back and watched it. I would say maybe there's three, arguably four sacks that just weren't on the old line. Yeah. They weren't great uh, opening up holes, but Marshall as poor as their quarterback is uh, they, they match up physically. They're better physically than most teams in the conference. I mean, they, there's a reason why, we were 10 and a half point favorites over middle Tennessee who beat Marshall by double digits. And then Marshall came in two weeks, you know, later and we're only five point favorites home. I mean, there's respect on their name and what type of players they recruit. We're always at the top of the conference recruiting with them and they have those types of athletes. Uh, You know, the, the frustrating part was, it's just, it seemed like everything was so self-inflicted. Same with the Chris, you know, Chris, the safety, you know, I talked about on the form. I mean, that was him. BJ Etney got, Etney and got beat on the play. But if you go back and freeze frame it, there's a point where Chris, if he just, even though he pulled it, if he just slid to his left and looked, he had a chance to get, I believe it was Mitchell or Antoine, they had two receivers uh, to, you know, the top of the screen, you pick up five yards and just get out of there. But he kind of panicked, turn around, he ran backwards into the end zone. He yeah. got sacked by a guy that wasn't even initially rushing the passer. Oh, so, uh, there was two sacks where Marshall just sent more guys than we were blocking. Yeah, more guys. I just, it, it, I don't know if that's on the coaching staff 
for not realizing that and Chris looking at the sideline and him, you know, pulling, telling you whoever the running back is, hey, uh, we're, we're putting this block on or putting this hot route on or, you know, Harrison coming from the slot and we need you to throw a block here and we're going to run a two-man route. I don't know whose responsibility is, but they just missed two of those. We're yeah. Marshall just rush seven, we block five. You can't, you can't ask our guys to block more. Yes, there's like an issue at right tackle. Uh, but, yeah, I think the O-line's getting a little bit more uh, venom than they should because it's – and, again, I also put this out with the running game. We're not Wisconsin. We're not going to line up the ball, run 40 seconds off the clock. Well, Wisconsin's a bad example after this weekend, but you guys get the <laughs> picture. Uh, and just run it down your throat. Her running attack is based on rhythm, okay? It's based on keeping teams off balance and – you know, uh, one of Malcolm Davis's best runs of the game was on a third and 10 and they blew, you know, opened up the mm-hmm. hole. It's, it, it's based on keeping them off balance. It's why the, the fourth down was so frustrating. You know, Lane mentioned that he says a bad call, but, and we talked about this with the quarterbacks a bit rotating. Tronti has a nice run. You switch yeah. instead of just going and just right. hurrying to the line and handing it off before Marshall's guys can get a break. We put Chris back in and Marshall's defense, has a chance to get its hand in the dirt and, you know, tighten up for a third and short. So you know, that was kind of the frustrating part. It's just we left those on the table. Lane um, Lane actually mentioned the, you know, calling when Marshall blitzed and, and just sent more guys than we had to block. <clears throat> he did mention that there was, you know, it might might be on the coaches uh, to get out of the play that was that was called and we just didn't do that. Um, you know, again, there, there was there was issues all around, um, and on you could say on on the the bright side at this point, which maybe we're not at the bright side yet. All of that happened, and we were still right there. Yeah, we still should have won the game. I mean, defensively, uh, I, I I want to look for scheme issues defensively, and big chunk plays have been a problem for FAU. And again, we talk about kind of the design. Uh, the, the tackles were just missed. Players we expect to make tackles. Uh, you know, the final touchdown run with Knox, uh, yeah. Brown just got, he, he was in the hole. He was there. That should have been third and one or fourth and one. And we should have forced them to kick a game winning field goal, which could have changed our last drive. And maybe Chris and, didn't feel like he needed to throw it up and gain barge back. We could have had 40 seconds to yeah. get field goal range, which might change everything. Um, Marshall, we were up 17 to 10. They were driving to score before the half. And Knox had a run down to like our two yard line. Uh, yeah. Leroy, who's maybe the best pure tackler on the team, had Knox in the backfield, overran him a bit, uh-huh. you know, and missed the tackle. The um, first touchdown, you know, uh, Marshall scored. Their tight end catches it. We kind of have a smaller guy wrapping him up, and our other, our one of our guys came and hits our guy off of him, and he scores a touchdown. It's just. Really was nothing Marshall was doing. Uh, and, and frustrating. What it, what is it with Marshall and two hundred yard games? I feel like we 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 have given up more two hundred yard games to Marshall to, than any than any other team. Um, yeah, I mean they're physical. It's I, I, they're they're a physical front. It's what they do. It's you know what they recruit. Um, it, it's hard to answer, but you know even I think Jake pointed this out that. Uh, Marshall really didn't get its running game going until late in the second quarter, until that last drive. They were actually, every was kind of holding Knox. Yeah. It felt like they were just gashing us. And then all of a sudden it just kind of fell apart at the end. Maybe it, they got tired. He, I mean, he had the two, basically that, that last drive, he, he was the drive. He had yeah. like 70 yards on that. Well, one. The, the big frustrating part of that drive is, you know, we'll, talk about you know the officiating is his 30 yard run should have been called back and it should have been third and 16. Uh, yeah. but the conference mm-hmm. officials do not know the rules. But before uh, we get on to that though I just want to say that that run uh, that drive that it was the, the last of the half uh, from Marshall or the second last uh, they started within their own 10 yard line uh, and then with three plays uh, Knox got like 80 yards. Uh, yeah. He had 82 yards on a 92 yard drive and their yeah, total, he was the drive and the, the, their total yards for that entire quarter was just 100. 
we can get frustrated at the pass defense, but man, if you take away the play where our two guys ran into each other and just, you know, we haven't see, really seen one since the UCF game, but that was a busted coverage. Uh, it's little PSA. Someone that's trying to rewatch the games, and especially me, who's really into secondary play. Uh, Jack, you can probably echo this for me and stuff there. I, I can't do the silver numbers anymore. I have no idea. They're, I'm trying to see <laughs> who's playing nickel, who's playing star, and kind of get a feel of how they're rotating. Because they had Miko Dotson kind of playing star, safety, inside corner this week, Gilbert kind of. And, huh. and I'm very interested in just figuring out how is yeah. rotating its DBs, where's everyone kind of playing because we kind of play a lot of dbs and i, I want to see what everyone's fitting and I, I i have to watch a play six times to be like is that young or you yeah. know There's no idea because our, our defense as is already rotates so much uh and we, yeah we, we did do we did some things differently caliph bryce uh led the team in tackles well jose barwell was out so yeah but it's kind of taking that role but you, you still have uh, Kiki, you still have uh, Smith, you know, some other guys that would be playing that, that core linebacker spot. Uh, but th- those silver numbers are a joke. It's impossible to see anything. Even uh, the spotters with their binoculars up in the press box can't see a thing. We're trying to figure out who is who. And you know how fast conference USA offenses play. We don't know until a play later. It's too late. Um, you one of the, one of the things to to mention also you know kind of going back to how close we were to winning the game, Marshall fumbled the ball at least four times you know and, and we talk about this a lot where like the ball bounces we talked a lot about this last year with just nothing kind of came up FAU if the ball literally bounces another way one time in the game uh, on Friday night there's a we probably win the game like if Marshall doesn't. If, when they fumble the ball, they don't fall directly right back on it. Um, you know, like, it's just kind of, again, that, that's what was the way the game was going. Uh, things were not going our way. And it's, uh, they fumbled the ball three times on one drive. Um, they ended up kicking a field goal. Um, but, like, still, <clears throat> it's just kind of like that, that, that thing where um, we make a good play on defense, ball pops out and they fall right back on it, or somebody falls right back on it. It jumps forward. There, there was one uh, where it went past uh, the first down. They ended up getting, like, five or six more yards out of it. So When can you fumble? I, am I confused? I'm asking. I'm legit asking right now. When can you fumble a ball forward and advance it? Normally, if an offense fumbles forward out of bounds, it goes to the spot. It didn't go out of bounds, though. They recovered it in bounds. Okay. Okay. I missed. I was on that side. I didn't see if it went out of bounds. Or okay. All right. I was yeah. just. I wasn't one hundred percent sure. But it's. It, it's not <clears> the <throat> end of the world. In the end, we lost it to a physical Marshall team. Um, in a game that should have went our way, we weren't outplayed by any means. Uh, and you know, we, we talked about Chris and Jack was saying this earlier. You know, Chris made a, has made a huge step this year. I mean, he's putting up. He has 10, so 10 TDs, a couple rushing, only two interceptions. Both interceptions were just at end of games where he's just trying to make something happen. He was just trying to make something happen at the end of that Marshall game. Uh, and he's taken a huge step forward with missing the spring. So, like, him getting better on reading safeties coming down and uh, doing that, it, I fully expect him to – improve on that uh you know some people got mad about him running the ball and he's not a great runner and every still has to do it to keep him honest uh you know so every once in a while take your two or three yard gain with him yeah uh it, it doesn't make any i i don't know and, and I, I don't know why but it every i feel like every read option that he does where he keeps it gets blown up um yeah, well he doesn't even have any room it's like he doesn't even get the one in where it's like it's up for the touchdown where he kind of like right Totally catches the defense sleeping. I mean, I saw that a couple times um, in the fall. Yeah. Where he, like, he totally got the defense sleeping. We saw that against Middle Tennessee last year, where, like, the hole just opens up and he has a free. It just for, for it never seems game. to get that even, like, six or seven yards. It's always, like, one or two yards and he, he's done. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I'd also like to see – 
you know, and it is criticizing the O line. If you go watch those last couple drives where when Chris right now is at his most comfortable is when it's he just knows he's gonna pass. Yeah. It's like even it seems like he is more comfortable in third and twelve <laughs> and yeah. he's just like no reading, I'm gonna pass. I'm just gonna go back and just read the secondary and rip a pass. I mean, he threw that ball to Mitchell um over the middle on that last drive picked up 18 yards then he comes back gets sacked i think after a couple plays gets sacked and then throws the most gorgeous back shoulders pass to d'angelo antoine i mean he is just comfortable so i'm just wondering if the offense is struggling in its traditional sense if there's point now where it's like maybe lane just says let's look at it and go now let's just go four wide and maybe let chris just kind of throw it up to guys. I know they want yeah. to use Harrison and get them open out in the flats and you have the run motions, but man, it, it's in a weird way. It's tempting just to line him back up there and say, all right, we're going to run Antoine Harrison meet, uh, um, Mitchell. And even, um, Harrison Bryant. Yeah, Harrison Bryant, John Rain, we'd love to see them get some more passes. Um, sometimes see them get them more involved because they haven't been as involved as I feel like as they were last year and a couple years beforehand. I want to go back to that that pass to D'Angelo Antoine. Uh, that was a risky pass, by the way. He almost got a got away with an OPI uh, a little bit there. In the yeah, there was, there was, I saw that little shove. Yeah, you saw um, that, right? But, I mean, yeah. what, what a gutsy throw. Um, I think that was one of the passes that – Robinson kind of made a mistake with uh, Bryant. When you saw the replay, Bryant was a bit open on the seam. Um, but, you know, that's just the kind of passer that he is. Uh, he has uh, – he trusts his receivers, and he knows that if there's a small window, he can sling it in there. Uh, and that's that's when he's at his best, just like you said, Shane. It's, it, and, and the old line also protected him pretty well in the final few drives as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there was two there, – yeah, I mean, on that final drive, I mean, he had – all day to throw. Uh, yeah. So, it, it, like I said, it seems like the old line struggling more in kind of the traditional the offense reading or just something's not there. They're not just getting whooped physically every play. It's, it seems, and yes, there is plays where, and like you said, BJ got beat bad on that safety play. I mean, he's still new to right tackle. I think that was right. kind yeah. of a, a wit, you know, he's still kind of learning that, and a guy might have put a good move on him. But, man, it seems like when they just line up and say, okay, we, we're passing the ball here, they, they do well. So it's – There seems to be and, – and it makes sense for, um, for John Mitchell to – he and uh, John Mitchell to have some connection. They have that – it always seems like on third and long, you'll see John Mitchell sliding over the middle. It's, and it's always he – always, he never catches it running, you know, running full speed. It's always like a nice slide. You can see they've got some continuity there. Um, and I just want to also take a second to to point out, like, what a surprise, like, great surprise D'Angelo Antoine has turned out to be. I mean, like, he is – he's reliable. He's got great hands. He can certainly run away from any, anybody. Um, Marshall purposely kicked away from him, really, the whole game. Um, I was kind of hoping that, that he would get a chance. I was hoping he'd get a chance at the end. Um, but uh, he, he certainly he, – he led the team in, in receiving. He had over 100 yards. Speaking of kicking, and this is getting a little um, – just kind of in special teams here. Uh, I would just – I found it interesting to start the game, Nico Dotson uh, was returning a couple a, of points. I found yeah. interesting. Uh, you know, Dante Cuzart is super reliable and to catch at the ball, and he was even smart to know the rules more than the referees. If Marshall touches it, you right. have a free pickup, even if – he ran at 99 yards and fumbled and Marshall recovered after you automatically get to that ball. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, good awareness on him, but it, there was a couple times where Marshall was punting and I felt like, man, I wish we had a returner that could get the offense a little better. You know, it, it just yeah. was like, it's hard to just eat a 45 yard punt every time, man, I'd like, man, I would like to just pick up 15 yards and get the offense a little better position here. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know what his return average right now is, but I don't think he has one for more than maybe one in the Charlotte game. I think he had yeah. for more than 10 yards. So it's like, you know, um, it, it's hard in college to return kicks now, but yeah, I mean, we're really missing Kareth White in there. I mean, just we 
special teams hasn't been bad this year. The field goal kicking has been better, but it's like, I'm still waiting um, on kind of the big special teams play. Yeah. Uh, you know, we I, haven't I, had one. I thought against, uh, against middle, he was close. Um, but uh, I, I think, and I think that probably Marshall saw that and said, we're just not even going to kick to him. Um, but uh, yeah, Miko Dotson was, was returning, Miko Dotson was returning punts. Uh, and I thought that was the first, I, I, maybe I, I stopped paying attention on punts, but I think that's the first game that he was starting as the, the punt returner and then Kusar took over. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, there, there was one, one, maybe two, but one is really sticking out where Kusart, um, or wh- whoever the punt returner was, had, had a good 10-yard cushion to make a move, and he just called a fair catch. It was kind of, you know, we, we had some opportunity there. But, um, yeah, special teams, special teams didn't cost us the game uh, yesterday, which was great. I mean, uh, Vladimir Rivas had a solid game. He made, what, a 35-yard uh, extra point. Due to the the stupid un, uh, unsportsmanlike conduct thing, um, yeah. Again, there there were certainly some good things good things to happen. Um, and kind of going back to Chris a little bit, if he can get a little better at, at at reading the defense on what's coming, I think one of the again one of the things that uh, you know we kind of continuously talk about is um, well, I, I feel like I harp on it uh, a lot, is that getting the ball out faster, um, which is what we did when we had success, uh, and then Chris kind of waiting and maybe waiting that split second too long for the play to develop, uh, where he, you know, he knows that he, he's going to have an opportunity to make a big play when he should you know, take the shorter read. Um, yeah, so, I mean, frustrating, uh, a, a really frustrating game. Uh, all the way around again. Defense, you know, they, they um, outside of the bad tackling, wasn't you know wasn't the worst thing. We kind of put ourselves in position to 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 win the game. Um, but again, you you give up 220 yards um, on the ground and 90 yards and penalties. It's it's a, a tough. Not that we necessarily gave up. The, we deserved all 90 yards of penalties. Well, I mean. <laughs> Are we going to just dive into it now, guys, since you mentioned penalties? Yeah, let's, let's do this. I, I'm let's. pretty sure this is why everyone wanted to listen to, to this episode. Um, we're recording this on Sunday. It's now 9 p.m. Uh, Lane did his uh, teleconference with the media at 5 p.m. And about an hour beforehand, uh, there was a press release from the conference saying that Lane Kiffin has been fined and reprimanded uh, eternally but fined $5,000 for his tweet uh, when he basically called out the Conference USA refs. Um, well, the, I'm, I'm just saying those, those penalties, especially in the first quarter, when we even were dominating the game, we scored two touchdowns. We almost had the same amount of yards gained in the first quarter as we did penalties. Three of those came from pretty weak defensive pass interference calls that were not called uh, the same way later in the game. Most of those penalties actually were on the far sideline, the Atlantic sideline uh, where the away team is. And a lot of times when FAU uh, was throwing the ball and they thought that there was a defensive pass interference, it was actually on the FAU sideline. And our side judges didn't call a thing. It's as if the conference, you know, had a memo <laughs> last week and the guys closest to us didn't read it, but the, the guys on the Marshall sideline you know, read every single word with a magnifying glass, studying it all night long. I, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna get frustrated with pass interference. I just tend to be a defensive person. I think some of them are kind of ridiculous. I think obviously, I think we kind of got even. Cooley's pass interference at the beginning. He seems to get hit with one every game. It's certainly a little. But I thought that was tic tac. They got it back with a ball. Where our next drive with Mitchell. Um, they obviously missed one on Mitchell going over the middle, but you know that's not like my huge issues with the refs. It's not knowing the rules. I mean, I mentioned it earlier on the podcast, um, and I think this is Lane's frustration is Knox had that 30-yard run from our 50 to our 20. They call it unsportsmanlike conduct. 
which moved it back to our 35. But Marshall threw out a first and 10. So all it did was take a 30-yard run to a 15-yard run. But the penalty happened during the play. And when a penalty happens during a play, like any other play, like a holding, a chop block, right. a face mask, anything else, it, you don't get the play. It would have been third and 16 from their own 35. Good luck yeah. third and 16 with Isaiah Green. Okay? So – for simply them not knowing a rule, Marshall got a first down in 15 yards. It's – and actually, if you can count with – because they gained the – they gave them the yards that they gained, and they didn't really mm-hmm. take up the yards that where they should have been back. I mean, it's a it's a swing of 30 yards for just not knowing the rules. I mean, that, that's something you should get 100 times. I get it. Pass interference is an issue from the NFL down to high schools games I yeah. go to on the weekend. Nobody seems to know what the real definition is and how much to let them hand jostle and whatever. Uh, but just not knowing the rules. I mean, this is a problem throughout the conference. We're not the only one. Yeah. Uh, I find it ridiculous. Um, I don't know. We're at, you know, you're talking about this, everything that uh, I think Lane is just smart for tweeting that out. Uh, very different. You see, uh, Will Muschamp went off on the refs yesterday in a Florida game and no one's talked about him today. Uh, Lane, this, sends a tweet out uh, yeah. at like nine o'clock when every single college football fan writer are all in front of their TVs and their computers home on a Saturday night watching Michigan, Alabama. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's thinking that much into it, but things are not a tweet at the perfect time. And every college football writer and stuff, and everyone's defended it, you know, like because yeah. other co- people from other conferences, trust me, have their gripes about refs too. Um, so, but I find it funny that you check you this out. Like Marshall fans are getting mad about it. Like, no, they, everyone should be kind of standing high behind improving the officiating in this conference. Uh, I don't know. I don't know much about the background, the officials in the conferences, you know, uh, there's been a lot of discussion from what's going on in the NFL. And one thing I heard was, is a good point is as gambling becomes more and more popular in this country, uh, people are going to want explanations like it, yeah. it, the leagues from the NFL down to the Sun Belt, uh or anything you can put money on legally as it grows in this country. Uh, well, sorry, we have inconsistencies. Isn't an answer when millions yeah. of dollars, I mean, we're talking way down the line. I heard someone, a, a really smart podcast I listened to and someone's like, this could get to the point where if there's, gambling involved and there's inconsistency in the referees we're talking like congress involvement and no one wants to be part of that i think the first step and i think this is lane's frustration uh jack you know you're on the call when lane said what when the conference says well we're going to punish you publicly but we're going to take care of it internally with the refs and lane's like what does yeah. that do for us how do we know yeah. they send him an email or you, we don't know what the punishment is i want like some transparency I think yep. conference should be transparent on how they're trained. I think officials uh, should get reports at the end of the game. I think it kind of works in the NBA. It doesn't make anyone feel better. Like it doesn't make anyone feel better for the next day for the ref to be like, well, we messed up, but I think their punishments should be public. I'm sorry. They don't have a union um, in college. So like this needs, it all needs to be transparent. Like and, we need to, Crews are rated too. Um, yeah. I, and I need to, we need to know. I want to know if I'm getting the the the, the C minus crew. I, I want to know. Like it's it's. I think transparency is the first step. I, I don't know how. I would like to hear someone's opposite well, opinion on that. Um, it's it's interesting because transparency would would, would be nice, but we, we need to think about this for a second. Um, in, in the teleconference Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon, according to, to Coach Kiffin, the conference said that there were inaccuracies with how the referees officiated the game on Friday. That means that they admitted things were wrong. Uh, and they weren't going to go public with that. They were not going to go public. Lane Kiffin basically leaked that out that the conference knew that the refs messed up. So we need transparency from, from the officiating crew, but we also need uh, transparency with the conference and how far their cover-up was going to go, if you will. Uh, it's just 
maybe like an apology would be nice. You know, when we see this week after week throughout the conference, throughout college football, but especially Conference USA, it happened to FIU a couple weeks ago and they played Louisiana Tech. Um, and everyone is on board with Lane Kiffin right now, except for about seven Marshall fans online who just cannot get over the fact that they are now losing this PR battle um, with, with FAU. They, they cannot stand losing to oh, us. Well, Lane, yeah, Lane, Lane is having – but Lane's smart. Lane's kind of, sweet at LeBron James. He's yeah. winning. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, let's yeah. and, play and, the um, – you know, if everyone remembers the great game day story about the um, long snapper who was blind at USC, he, you know, he got a chance. I think he was yeah. in Underlane uh, at Jack Owen. It was a great college football story. Walked on USC, was playing under Pete Carroll. He was blind, got a chance to long snap um, in a game. And it was like a great, you know, just feel good college football story uh, with him. And uh, he, he just tweeted back at Lane that, you know, he would, uh, he would definitely be up for an offer to be a conference trade rest. <laughs> you know, so it's just it, he's having fun with it. And in the end, Lane Kiffin's bigger than Conference USA, social media-wise. Like, yeah. So it's – but I wish the other co- – you know, I hate the, well, the officiating didn't cost us the game. It's okay to be like, hey, we didn't tackle good tonight. We didn't block good tonight. We should have won. But, man, the officials kind of lost us the game, too. I mean, it's okay to say that. Yeah. Despite whatever Marshall fans want to say, we actually kind of beat them in every single statistical category except for rushing yards. Um, that being said, the more that Marshall fans complain and moan about Lane Kiffin and FAU fans, the longer this story will stay in the national spotlight and the longer the story will, will remain credible. Uh, so that's just something that, you know, the, the thundering turds, I mean, thundering herd fans uh, should be thinking about up in West Virginia when they're mad online. What's interesting is, I mean, again, saying that Lane Kiffin is, is his Twitter is bigger than Conference USA, Conference USA is like the best, the best example of that because like, he he doesn't he doesn't care like you can you can tell he's pissed at the refs but like he's still tweeting about getting fined and to me the one of the funniest things is him tweeting at LeBron James um, <clears throat> about like he just he doesn't care like he he knows he knows he's in the right um, and certainly a lot of Marshall fans will will um, will disagree but I I mean a lot of Conference USA is kind of rallying behind him certainly FAU is rallying behind him I I I have a feeling Brian Wright would. Uh, you know, he'll have some politically correct kind of like, well, yes, you know, Lane and I agree that there were some problems, but he won't really mention Lane tweeting. No, but in the end, this is great for FAU. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, again. For our team, this is it's, lovable. It's the, the, I mean, it's great. He's bringing up in a 21st, 29, in a 2019 type way, he's bringing attention to an issue, kind of just laughing about it. And I, I don't know if the conference USA, I would like to think the office cares, but I, I think conferences tend to be so uh, it, it had. I, I think they're going to, um, yeah, they're, uh, you know, no fun, basically. You know, I, yeah. I think it's, uh was kind of funny that he, in his, his press conference, he was, um, you know, like, I don't have the money to be fined anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Uh, and, and he even, <clears throat> even tweeted at uh, the Owls nest saying, you know, I don't have the money, but there goes the 5,000 bucks. He did that a few hours ago. Um, <laughs> so if you look through his tweet and replies, you'll see that there. Um, I'm, I'm happy that, Dan, you mentioned that Conference USA fans are rallying around uh, Lane Kiffin. Uh, FAU fans are also rallying around him, which I think is great because – Friday night and Saturday, we were all just kind of in a crappy, crappy mood after the game. And we were all kind of talking about, is this honeymoon stage with Lane Kiffin over with? And now the second that the conference finds Lane, uh, we all just go in to defend him. Uh, it's as if he's, he's building a, a, a Twitter army to take on the conference. And Marshall fans are just kind of sitting over there in the corner like, I don't even know what, what people from West Virginia look like, but you can imagine. Uh, it's just, it's just, just awesome to see. It's almost as if we have a bit of our swagger back, if you will. We lost, but we're still running things. We're running- I'm, not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> What's that? 
I, I, I see what you're saying. I'm happy FAU fans are traveling, and then we're going to talk a bit. Let's, I mean, let's kind of break into what we think the coming weeks is, because Western Kentucky yeah. won again yesterday. Um, yeah. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but, like, I'm just not there. You know, there's still – there's fun uh, swagger back, but let's, you know – Well, uh, all right, so let's, let's – Let's think of all right. So th- this wasn't the end of our season, right? No. Um, we're 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 four and three. We have a very good chance of ma- winning seven games. Like realistically, seven games is is kind of our bottom, right? So that guarantees us a bowl game. Um, you know, kind of talking about Conference USA. So right now, uh, uh, Western Kentucky, which we'll dig a little bit deeper into them later on in the week, um, <clears throat> or later on, I should say. Um, not later on when we play them, sorry. Um, they're undefeated in a conference, doing really well. Yeah, they lost to an FC, FCS team in the beginning of the year, but they've, they've played well. Um, you've got Marshall, who now holds the tiebreaker over FAU. But the big game this week, Marshall versus Western Kentucky, if Western Kentucky beats Marshall and then FAU beats Western Kentucky, we're in good shape, right? So uh-huh. there's still – there's still a, a long way to go. And I would say FAU still controls, even because I don't buy Marshall winning out. So I think FAU really still controls its own destiny into Conference USA East. That's yeah, I mean, I, I almost wish, Jack, I want to know what you kind of think of this just because of, like, how FAU has bounced back. Uh, I almost wish we were playing with Kentucky this week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, like I wish we just had the big game this week. Pissed off, we lost in a shitty way. Let's go beat the team this week. Old Dominion is reeling right now. They their offense is not good. Uh, you know, so it's it, it. I know we'll go up there and maybe get a nice victory, but man, I kind of wish we were just playing West Kentucky this week. They're not scoring points at all. I mean, they only scored thirty versus. Charlotte was one of the worst defenses in Conference USA, and two of those were on trick plays. But their defense aligned is, and defense is great, and they do all the little things. They only had one penalty yesterday. Uh, they don't turn over the ball, so they're kind of just winning in your, uh, for a South Florida fan reference, a Dave Wanstat type of way. Good defense, special teams, good field position, you know, kind of, you know, we'll get pass rush and – you know, when you kind of have that type of game, you go up there on the road, that feels like a game that could, you know, it could go either direction. We're getting in a close game with them, but, yeah. and I wish we were just playing them this week. I mean, instead of Old Dominion, how do you feel about that, Jack? Yeah, I, I feel like at least amongst us fans, we're talking about like having our swagger back. I feel like we kind of have this FAU against the world mentality, which I think is great. That's something that I've wanted FAU fans and FAU as a program to have for a long time. I love when everybody hates us. And I love it when that motivates us. So now that we're down and Marshall fans or some Marshall players are doing our little dance that we invented last year uh, on the sidelines and talking all this talk, we want to go up to Bowling Green and beat the snot out of the team that's winning the East. Uh, kind of show everyone that, you know, the revenge tour is, is still on. Uh, you didn't derail, derail the lane train. We just made a little pit stop. Um, I, I wish we had Western Kentucky right now. I, I would actually really like our chances if we were playing up in Bowling Green. Old Dominion is just kind of a snooze fest. We're going to talk about it later this week. They're, I mean, God forbid, if we lose this game, then we'll talk about how, you know, the season's in trouble. But I just I, – I don't see it happening. Um, and, and we, we lose that, this game, it's, it's something. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Wisconsin. But we open – we'll talk about this week and – we will find a guess it, but like we hope 16 and a half point favorites. Yep. Most in that series history between Old Dominion. That's the largest uh, uh, line. That and we've teams. crushed them the last two years too. Um, I yep. think their, their coach is wow. There has been there a while is their only coach in program history. I think he's a good guy, but I mean, it's how many years has he had now? Kind Five, six, know. seven. Like, he's yeah. kind of like Howard at the end, you know, <laughs> unfortunately yeah. it's just all kind of, and he even uh, had some good quarterbacks, too. Remember, he had uh, Heineke for a few years. Yeah. That, well, that's the thing. They kind of busted on the scene in, yeah. um, in FBS. Uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's fine. Yeah. You know, they busted on the scene in FBS, and uh, 
you know, maybe they thought they were a little farther ahead than what they actually were. But let's not panic. It's just like kind of take it like week by week. You go get this win. You're feeling better. And you go to West Kentucky, you win that game, and it's game on. We're back on it. Yeah, shulable. Let's do it. Uh, I I do like how we do know who is going to be real in this conference now and and who is overrated. Charlotte, overrated. Um, Do we know? uh, do we know? Because I've watched I, FIU's four and three, and I do not know what to make of that team. I mean, because we we kind of pushed them off, um, but that West Kentucky yeah. loss doesn't look as bad now, especially since Morgan missed the last quarter of the game. They only lost by a touchdown. Um, oh, you mean FIU? Yeah, I mean. Oh no, they look good. Yeah, no, they threw well, the corner. But do they? Because they're, first of all, their last three wins were UTEP, UMass, and. Sure. and in, yeah, Charlotte. I mean, so yeah. and Charlotte all in put, a lot, put up a lot of points. And it was kind of by design. I was, you know, did the Shula Bowl podcast. It's a little bit more conference USA. Thinking you know, about talking to Eric Henry. It was a little bit by design, and they sat a bunch of guys out. But like, Morgan only completed 10 passes for UTEP. I mean, they weren't throwing the ball. It seemed like they were just making an effort to just kind of do nothing but win and get out of there with no style points. But still, UTEP was able to hang around. And UTEP's done that – well, they've done it for a couple games uh, this year. They're certainly near the bottom of Conference USA. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, you, you could say that Conference USA is kind of a mess like it always is. Um, yeah. And we, and we, we'll, we'll kinda... I think the West. I think the West is solidified. Louisiana Tech is a heck of a football team. So I, yeah. I was going to say we'll, we'll kind of yeah. wrap up with uh, with this, and we won't we won't do the kind of normal. We kind of talked a lot about Conference USA already, but uh, Louisiana Tech really you know made a statement it. this weekend by beating yep. uh, Southern Miss. I mean, they're certainly they're the team to beat in the West, and, and it's, it's, they, yeah, they you have a senior quarterback. quarterback. They have a lot of seniors. I mean, that's a very senior related <clears throat> team. The running back, a yeah. lot of the a lot of their good players. Yeah, it's um, you kind of cut out there, Shane. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll finish my thought. Yeah, so um, kind kind of similar to, um, well, I shouldn't say how much similar, but the, the having a senior quarterback. I mean, Jamar Smith has been there for well, obviously for, for four years, but it seems like he's been there forever. Yeah. Um, and you know, things are kind of hitting it at a you know hitting at the right <clears throat> hitting at the right time. And uh, Skip Holtz is not a bad coach. Um, yep. Sorry, USF fans. So, uh, I mean, yeah, he didn't work out at USF, but he had a, a ton of success at Eastern Carolina. Yep. Um, you know, he's had a couple of recruiting classes under his belt now. So, yeah, I mean, that was that was a pretty um, and, uh, a, a pretty good game. And I think, again, they, they kind of established who is dominant in the West. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what we mentioned last week, that whoever wins this game uh, between USM and Law Tech is going to be in control in the West. I will say it's interesting. I'm checking out Tech's schedule right now. Uh, At UTEP, win. Home against North Texas, most likely a win, especially concerning whatever issue Mason Fine is having uh, again. Uh, And here's a tough stretch. Uh, Going to Huntington to play Marshall, and then going to Birmingham to play UAB. Uh, Birmingham, UAB has kind of been a team, uh, you know, maybe they could compete in the West, maybe they won't. They kind of look back and forth. They that, lost. UAB is kind of fraudulent in my eyes. I mean, I, I agree, but, you know, they played Western Kentucky here, tonight. Here, here's a stat. Here's a what I just, before you get to do, here's a UAB stat. If you take all their FBS wins, all, they have five wins versus FBS teams, okay? Those five teams have combined for two wins. <laughs> so, Can yeah. To a uh, Ak- no, Akron, Southern Miss. Western Kentucky, uh, Rice, UTSA, Old Dominion. Holy crap. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Akron's 0-7. UMass is 0-7. Uh, Old Dominion's one. Sorry, three wins. And UTSA, well, they won last night. So, yeah, oh. UTSA is their best win. So, but then yeah. you can see how they close it off, though. They have Tennessee next in Knoxville, Southern Miss in Hattiesburg, home against UTEP, home against Louisiana Tech, and then going to Denton. Oh. Things are going to get fined out because even we got to play Southern Miss, who Southern Miss is still a good team. And right. Western Kentucky has to go to Hattiesburg. So, yeah. I mean, there's – like, it almost feels like 
uh, since after you lost, and I made the point of the podcast last week, if we would have, it would sting, would have stings most about the game, not only us just not liking Marshall and Doc Holliday, is we could have really took control and even gave ourselves yeah. a margin for error. But it almost feels like this race is just kicking off. I mean, there's a lot of games where a lot of good teams have to play each other in the coming weeks. Honestly, uh, man, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like FIU, Southern Miss, in the conference championship game. Because yeah, I still somehow play. Rice and, <laughs> and Old Dominion are going to make it in on a triple tiebreaker. It's, I, so, Great. I mean, it's well, like we're just – the, this race, it, it feels like it was, um, you know, it's almost like you're, you're watching a NASCAR race and the cars, the first 50 laps are just all kind of bumping, getting in, fighting for position. And now it's like go time. Now it's a it, lot of tough cross conference. I, that's, that's true. I didn't know Louisiana Tech had to go to Marshall. So, I mean, that's, that's a tough one for Marshall for even if we kind of need the West Kentucky to win this weekend. Um, but, you know, that's. Yeah. That, that will help our cause a lot, is Western Kentucky winning this weekend. So, but let's, let's just see. Um, I wanted to ask you guys before we, we end the show, do you think it's better when, like, half of the conference is fighting each other to kind of pull away? Or is it better when you have a team like Marshall with Rakeem Cato when they were undefeated and getting ranked when it was us uh, in 2017 when we won the conference? You know, one – team that's just dominating everybody that everyone tries to gang up against like which which I, do you think is more entertaining? I think it's better naturally for the conference to have a premier team um, yeah I agree I, but, but it, you could still have some you know like let's just say it's Marshall Marshall has that team or they're 12 and 0 you know getting in the top 20 in rankings yada, yeah. yada, yada, yada. even Western Kentucky when they were under uh, yeah I mean when they had space. they were everyone in the conference by 40 points every weekend yeah uh you know, it's and then they went and beat a decent Marshall team, uh, the second or Memphis team in the in the Boca Bowl. But no, I think nationally the conference needs. That. I think one of the issues with conference USA is every team is kind of no one really separates, so they kind of all beat up each other, and the nation doesn't notice that they just kind of look down and see like a pile of six to nine win teams, and they really and then a few real bad ones at the bottom, and they don't really know what to make of it. Yeah, uh, so it's bad for the conference when it comes to notoriety. But is, is it better for fans for entertainment purposes, knowing that every game could, could change the entire impact of the season? Well, I think the main issue is, and this is one thing, and I've talked about this, uh, I just said, Walt D and I talk all the time. He's, uh, I got to talk about the bridge sometimes um, with FAU, is the way our conference, our bowl games lined up, like, I, I think SI had us today against Syracuse in the gas for the ball after we lost. So it's like, there's kind of this thing that we might end up getting a better bowl opponent for not winning the conference. <laughs> right. I think the question is a conference USA right now. What's the prize for winning the conference? Because it seems like everyone's going to kind of go to the bowl. that fits them best regionally. Anyways, like Southern Miss or lot tech going in New Orleans. Win conference. Yeah. That's a much better bowl. You kind of, kind of cut out. What, what was your finish your thought there, Shane? Because you kind of cut out. Conference USA, the uh, well, going to New Orleans, I should say. Southern Miss or La Tech going to New Orleans. I, I, just so you guys know, I don't think Louisiana <laughs> Tech will go to New Orleans if they have to play uh, Louisiana Lafayette or Louisiana Monroe because I, I feel like they'll just duck them and make oh, up. Yeah. Um, and they've done that in the past. Uh, but that, that being said, yeah, they're – Teams are just going to try and save as much money and see whichever bowl will give them the biggest payout and, and see whichever one will be closest and better for their fans. Uh, so Gasparilla against Syracuse, I'll take that any day of the week. You guys can crash at my place over here in Tampa. I'll be a good time. <laughs> no, I'm going to stay with Bartels. He, he lives in Tampa, doesn't he? Um, yeah, yeah. Jack, he, and I will, Jack and I will go to Venus on our own. We'll go we'll hit up the mind ourselves. We'll get that out. <laughs> I mean, when, when in Trampa, right? You know, when in Trampa, you do. Um, all right, well, I think, I think we effectively covered, this might be the most information-packed episode we've had this whole year. And we were, talk, we were talking about this last week where things were going well and we had nothing to talk about, but we lose a game and now we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. Um, uh, so, yeah, definitely um, – uh, sum everything up. Dif difficult. 
disappointing game, but you know, uh, like we said, it's the, the season could really, really be starting right now. And um, I, like I said, I, I think FAU really controls its own destiny. You lose another game, yeah, we're probably going to be rough, but um, we went out, and I would, I would almost put money that we would, uh, that we would represent Conference USA East. Conference Championship game. So, um, to wrap things up, we're going to be th- always thank you guys. We always want to thank you guys for, for joining us and watching us, whether it's on YouTube or Owl's Nest, uh, listening to our favorite podcasts which are available. <coughs> uh, definitely appreciate that. I love talking to you guys on Twitter. Make sure you check out the new Owl's Nest.com for the forum. Certainly like uh, when we're winning, the forum is pretty quiet. But then when things, uh, when we lose a game, boy, the forum lights up. So, definitely go check out that conversation there. Again, we thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you again later this week when we go over the weekend.